Before there was Lil Nods X, or Todrick Hall, or RuPaul, or Ricky Martin, or even Boy George, there was Sylvester. I promise you, nine times out of 10, when I ask people if they know Sylvester or if they like Sylvester, the response I get is a question. The question is, who is Sylvester? I usually respond by saying, do you know the song that goes, you make me feel mighty real. Then that person says, yes, I love that song. Then I say, that's Sylvester. Then that person says, oh, I always thought that was a woman. Well, Sylvester was a black man singing his songs and living his gay and open truth unabashedly for all the world to see. And it was uncomfortable for many of those who were watching, but not for him. When people felt the need to clutch their figurative pearls as they stared at him, his thought was, they'll just have to catch up. During his lifetime, some people would catch up to him, many others would not, but he seemed to find peace with it all. Let's get into it. If you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous celebrities from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Before we go on, some special words. Hello, this is Bernadette Stannis, Thelma from Good Times, and I'd love for you to join me on May 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Ty Said What Ty Said YouTube channel. We're celebrating her 30,000 subscribers. We're going to have fun and a good time. Now, on to why you are here. Sylvester James was born on September 6, 1947, in the Watts District of Los Angeles into a middle-class family. His mother was Letha. Sylvester was named after his father, who was often called Sylvester Sweet James. But according to Sylvester, there was nothing sweet about his father. In fact, he considered his father to be a lowlife. Soon after Sylvester was born, Sylvester's two younger brothers came along. After his youngest brother was born, Sylvester's father was committing adultery and then left his wife with three very young boys to rear on her own. Letha and her three sons had to move to a downtown housing project at Aliso Village before eventually being able to move into her parental home in Watts. With Letha's husband now shacked up with another woman, the only man in her life was Jesus, and she was taking herself and her children to his house, the church that is, every chance that she got. After being abandoned by her husband, Letha raised her three sons in the Pentecostal denomination of Christianity. The dramatic flair of black gospel music made a mark on Sylvester, and by the age of three, he was already performing songs of spiritual fire for the church. Recognized as a uniquely gifted singer, the church put him in a front and center role in their choir, and it was in that early role that he learned how to control his voice, but also sing with spiritual passion. At the age of eight, he sang the song, My Buddy, at the funeral of a fellow congregant, a child who was also only eight years old. It wouldn't take long for the young singer, who was mature beyond his years, to delight audiences with his eccentric and emotional vocal stylization, and it wouldn't take long for those same audiences who embraced his musicality to reject his humanity. Sylvester's Pentecostal church family at Palm Lane Church of God in Christ in South Los Angeles was the source of his childhood joy and affirmation. After a horrible incident that happened to him at the hands of a leader in that church, Sylvester soon found that same church family to be the source of his painful alienation and ostracization. 
The church's organ player molested Sylvester when he was only eight years old. One of the saddest parts of Sylvester's story is that he believed that he consented to this act with this grown man. You see, Sylvester had always been accused of effeminacy and even said that he recognized his own sexuality at a very young age. So in his mind, he must have wanted this to happen. But again, he was only eight and therefore could not consent to his assailant, who was indeed an adult. The adult attacker at his church had subjected Sylvester to sodomy. Sylvester had to be taken to a doctor for medical attention due to the injuries that he received as a result of this assault. He had to be hospitalized. The doctor who cared for him is the one who informed Sylvester's mother that her son was gay. Her strong ties with her church and her Pentecostal faith would not allow her to accept this fact, nor would she any longer accept her son, viewing homosexual activity as a perversion and a sin. And when Sylvester required hospitalization from the assault, the church, in a stunning display of hateful stupidity, treated the adult attacker and the child victim with the same level of scorn and damnation. News of Sylvester's, quote, homosexual activity, as the church would call it, didn't take long to spread through the congregation. And just like his assaulter, he was labeled a sexual deviant. Perhaps had the church called it what it was, assault instead of homosexual activity, there may have been a different outcome. But instead, Sylvester felt unwelcomed. He was now condemned in the place that allowed him his first opportunity to develop into a singer. So, when he finally felt like he could make up his own mind about it all, at the age of 13, he stopped attending the church. At some point during Sylvester's teen years, his mother remarried. Her second husband was Robert Sonny Hurd. He was gainfully employed as a supervisor at North American Rockwell, an aerospace manufacturing company. With his income, the family was able to move to a more affluent and predominantly white neighborhood and out of Watts. But Sylvester would not get to enjoy the upgraded lifestyle for the family for long. His stepfather never got along with him and his mother never came to terms with his homosexuality. So, after a heated argument, he left his mother and stepfather's house for good. The tension and conflict that resulted in between he and his mother caused him to move in with his grandmother, who had an accepting attitude toward homosexuality. It was good that she did, because Sylvester needed a covering, a protection from a world that he didn't know he needed to fear. During his teenage years, he not only lived an openly gay lifestyle, but he would often dress in full female attire. Transvestitism was illegal in California, but Sylvester often risked suffering severe consequences from police officers, or worse yet, from anti-gay vigilantes. One of the most admirable qualities about Sylvester was his tenacity to see through his own plan for his life, for his music, for his place in the world, regardless of all the adversity that he faced from day one, whether it was coming from his mother, his church, society in general, or even his music labels. Sylvester was determined to do things his way. And in a day and age where gay black men suppressed or lied about their homosexuality so that they could be in the entertainment industry, Sylvester said, the entertainment industry can't have me if they won't accept all of me including my homosexuality. In his day, that was unheard of. And even today, in 2021, major strides have been made for the LGBTQ community, but still, openly gay black male music artists are rarities. Just for fun, if you can name seven well-known openly gay black music artists, write their names in the comments. I'm curious to see what will be out there. I recall that a number of people claimed to know that Johnny Gill and Eddie Murphy had an affair when I read the comments in my video titled, Eddie Murphy, what really happened with the trans prostitute, what really happened to her? If you haven't seen that video, you can see it here. But nevertheless, neither Eddie Murphy nor Johnny Gill ever confirmed that rumor, 
and we are talking about openly gay men. Back to Sylvester. While in his first band in the 1960s, the Discotes, he befriended Etta James and often sang with her in the privacy of her home. After the Discotes broke up, Sylvester moved to San Francisco and joined the drag troupe, the Coquettes. This short period of Sylvester's career was musically rich. He explored his love of blues and jazz and even claimed on stage to be Billie Holiday's cousin. But with the Coquettes, the performance was so outrageous that the crowds came to the concerts more for the theatrics than the music. And Sylvester could definitely put on a show to make the crowd react. But he didn't want to be a clown. He wanted to be a singer. It wasn't until Sylvester began to perform under his own name with his own band that he could truly present his musical genius. And in putting together the final pieces for his band, his gay band with a gay black lead singer, he added a touch that was also certainly not the popular cultural standard, his backup singers. After Sylvester had just auditioned two tall, thin, leggy blondes, in walked Martha Wash to audition for her shot. She was black, she was fat, and her vocals blew Sylvester away. His question to her was, do you know another woman who can sing as well as you and who is as big as you? Yes, she knew the woman. Martha Wash brought Isora Rhodes back to Sylvester and the two ladies got the gig. Sylvester had his backup singers who he named Two Tons of Fun. They are part of his legacy to dance music, and I will get to them in a follow-up video. So here was Sylvester, out there with all of these elements that were certainly not desirable by pop culture standards in the 1970s. Gay musicians, a gay, black lead singer, two heavyset black women. Let's be honest, that kind of band would have a hard time making it in 2021. Even with all the supposed LGBTQ acceptance and body positivity movements going on, but there they were, as a collective unit, gay, black, fat, and wildly successful. Sylvester and his hot band and Two Tons of Fun pulled it together to bring him the biggest commercial success of his career. His performances were still flamboyant because he was still Sylvester, but the flamboyance was more measured so as to not distract from the music. Sylvester was most famous and popular for his soaring falsetto voice, and it was in that voice that he scored his biggest disco hits in the 1970s. You Make Me Feel Mighty Real, Dance, Disco Heat, and Body Strong. It was also the voice, the falsetto crooning combined with gospel shouting that some music critics say that Prince stole from Sylvester and then used for his entire career. How do you feel about that accusation? Disco in the 1970s was the friendliest form of music to gay performers, but that hospitality toward homosexuality that disco showed created a violent backlash among rock music fans. Fortunately, not everyone on the rock music side felt this way. Bruce Springsteen wrote the song Protection for Donna Summer to combat, in his words, quote, the subtle homophobia and racism of the anti-disco movement, end quote. But for most people who wanted to label themselves anti-disco or pro-rock, the bottom line was that disco was just too black and too gay, two things that Sylvester couldn't escape being. But the anti-disco movement virtually ended his career. Although Sylvester recorded traditional R&B albums, including one that had him in male attire on the album cover, he could never match the success that he found in disco. Bill Graham booked Sylvester to play the rock show at Winterland in San Francisco, but Sylvester was never booked again after he took the stage in silver sequined chaps. He wrote terrific songs for the albums Sylvester and Too Hot to Sleep. He covered Smokey Robinson and Ashford Simpson, but then he refused to perform as anyone but his over-the-top flamboyant drag-wearing self after feeling uncomfortable with conformity when he wore a man's suit to sing at an awards show. He had two gold records and opened for Chaka Khan, 
but the success that he deserved eluded him everywhere, except San Francisco. There, he was awarded a key to the city by the mayor. And on that same day, he recorded his only live album, Living Proof. That was in 1979, and the end of the decade that brought the end of an era in every way for Sylvester. Even his mother came to see him perform in San Francisco and was blown away at how people accepted him. Hopefully, she did at this point in his life as well, bringing an end to his 17-year separation from her. His music would never be more in demand than it was in the 1970s. Sylvester and his hot band had seen their glory days come and go in less than three years. And the city that he loved for embracing him and was so proud to call home would never be the same by the next year, the next decade, the 1980s. The 1980s were a tumultuous and ultimately sad period for Sylvester. The end of the disco era pushed Sylvester to explore different styles of his music, but more importantly, the devastation of AIDS in San Francisco tore apart his beloved community. Sylvester once said that his life did not begin until he moved to San Francisco, and his life would eventually end there before the decade was over. The place that allowed him to be free was falling apart, and his partner died of AIDS. Sylvester released his final album called Mutual Attraction in 1986. Arguably, the highlight of that album is his cover of Stevie Wonder's Living for the City. The video shows Sylvester performing throughout his beloved city of San Francisco and ends with him singing over church house piano and in front of a church choir. He is singing of the love that he found back at church where he started. No, it's not the same Pentecostal church where he grew up. He is at the Love Center Church, started by gospel singer Walter Hawkins in East Oakland. Hawkins envisioned a church that would welcome societal outcasts and love those deemed unworthy, inferior, or ugly by an ignorant culture. In this moment, in this video, Sylvester's life comes full circle. He never lost his faith in God, no matter how much certain close-minded keepers of his faith told him that he was unwelcome to it. In the final years of his life, he found a Christian community that protected him, the way that his church should have been able to do for him when he was that eight-year-old boy who had been attacked. Then, in 1988, the Castro Street Fair in San Francisco was named a tribute to Sylvester. Although he was too sick to attend, he could hear the crowds of people chanting his name from outside of his bedroom window. That was in October of 1988. Two and a half months later, Sylvester would be dead from complications of AIDS. Sylvester leaves a legacy of musical greatness and personal bravery and independence. He refused to live in shame for a natural inclination that enabled him to pursue and forge his own identity. He also rejected those who would try to use him as a political prop when people would ask him to label himself as a gay rights activist or a drag queen or you name it. He would simply say and proudly say, I am Sylvester. Sylvester was a rebel. He was black but did not quite fit into the black minority. He was gay, but did not quite fit into the gay minority. He often wore drag, but did not quite fit into the transvestite minority. He was a Christian, but did not fit into any Christian minority. He certainly never fit into the Christian majority. He represented himself and succeeded because of it, but was also unfairly and unjustifiably limited because of it. At the height of Sylvester's career, he was often called the queen of disco. But today, in the 2020s, he's one of the best kept secrets of American music. There is a cruelty that lies in this secrecy. He was a prolific musician who dared to be himself at a time when doing so was a literal threat to his life. 
The fact that his music catalog is virtually buried away in obscurity is a crime that speaks to bigotry and ignorance. And his place in history deserves better than that. Whether we're talking about Sylvester, the trailblazing LGBTQ person, or Sylvester, the music artist. say quiet <laughs> Sylvester please do me a favor introduce the ladies who is this lady Ms. here Martha Wash here soprano and Miss Isora Rhodes right here Isora nice to see you Martha thank you I have a terrible job this is not very gentleman but gentlemanly but would you ladies take your microphones when I you leave it. thank you ladies very much because two, yeah, two tons of fun yeah. <laughs> that's a t you could get killed my man what did you do I read somewhere you got you got tired of seeing those skinny model-like maidens who couldn't sing, so when you saw these ladies, you said, yeah, that's it. Well, you can look at them and tell they can sing. Oh, I'm yes. an immediate. Are they gospel background? Oh, yes, we all are. Where's your home? Los Angeles. No, somebody told me you're San Francisco. Are you, is that your adopted town? Yes, 10 years. Why did you leave uh, set designing, clothing designing, and go full force into the music business? Uh, there are people to do it for me now. <laughs> you don't have time to do your I own stuff now? I supervise, yeah, I supervise a lot with it. Do why, the girls. Why uh, is San Francisco, and why has it always been a cultural center? What makes it so different? It's a lot easier there. Mm. Is it free city? Yeah, a happy medium between L.A. and New York. Yeah, you said, <laughs> you said somewhere in writing that L.A. is a role town. You've got to play a role here, and up there you can be yourself. That's true. Be I'm so nervous about being here. You are. Yeah. You're amongst friends. Are you? Yeah? Right? <laughs> this is the easiest job you'll ever have. You want us to do it? Second number. Second number? All right. He's over there waving frantically at me. What's the name of the next one? You make me feel my new year. Ladies and gentlemen, Sylvester. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.